Um, this morning we begin with sh three short talks, and then the rest of the day is all you. And first up is me. I'm going to give an overview of the evolving scholarly record framework and a sense of what happened at the three previous workshops so that we're all on the same page. First, let's talk about what the scholarly record looks like. The majority to date has looked like this, but increasingly we're seeing data and presentations and social media and blogs and human observations and sensor data, and code, and algorithms, and visualizations. With the Evolving Scholarly Record essay, and I'm going to review this for you. Some of you may have read it a year ago, and some of you may have read it after complimentary cocktails on the plane on the way here. So we'll have a little review session. <laughs> Um, with, with this uh, essay, we wanted to consider the ways that fundamental changes in scholarly inquiry are affecting scholarly communication and ultimately the scholarly record, the curated account of past scholarly endeavor. The scholarly record is evolving into a corpus of ma material vastly different from the previous print-based version, driven by changes in research practices as well as changing perceptions about the long-term value of certain forms of scholarly materials. We particularly wanted to explore the related changes in the ways libraries and other stakeholders will steward the scholarly record. Understanding the nature, scope, and evolutionary trends of the scholarly record is important for libraries, for publishers, for funders, and of course for scholars themselves. Many issues are related to the scholarly record like preservation, citation, replicability, provenance, and data curation. Often these issues must be discussed and resolved across a range of stakeholders. So with this in mind, OCLC Research developed a framework of shared concepts and terminology that will help organize and drive discussions about the evolving scholarly record by providing this high-level view of the categories of materials in the scholarly record as, long, as well as the key stakeholder roles. A range of evolutionary trends are shaping the scholarly record. First, we're witnessing a shift from what was traditionally a print-centric scholarly record to one that is increasingly digital and residing on the network. Second, the boundaries of the scholarly record are shifting and blurring. It used to consist primarily of text-based materials like journals and monographs. Today it includes research data sets, computer models, interactive programs, complex visualizations, lab notebooks, and so forth. Take a little swig of whiskey here, vodka. <laughs> Don't worry, other speakers, there's more for you. <laughs> Third, some of the fundamental characteristics of the scholarly record are changing. It had been largely static in fixed formats. It was made available primarily through formal publishing, um, publication in books or journals, and its focus was on the final outcomes now the scholarly record is more mutable, more dynamic than in the past. It's made available through a blend of formal and informal publication channels, and its boundaries are expanding to include materials from the entire process of scholarly inquiry. There's an increased emphasis on the replicability of scholarly outcomes, as well as higher expectations around leverageability, or the ability to take previously published work and integrate it into new work. Finally, there's a recognition, a reconfiguration of the stakeholder roles associated with the scholarly record. The ways materials are created, managed, and consumed are changing in a variety of ways with traditional stakeholders taking on new roles and new stakeholders taking on traditional roles. At the heart of the framework is what has traditionally been the payload, research outcomes. The framework then distinguishes between materials that are byproducts of research activities, the process phase, and those that are byproducts of the publication of the scholarly outcome, the aftermath phase. We'll take a little walk around the framework and um, begin with the upper portion, which is about process. In the process, there are methods that might include lab notebooks, computer models, protocols. There's evidence. That could be data sets, primary source documents, or survey results. 
In discussion, there could be proposal reviews, preprints, conference presentations. In the center, the outcomes still include articles and monographs, but also simulations, performances, videos, and a gro growing variety of other end products. In the bottom part of the framework, we see we represent the aftermath. And here we see discussion again. This time, it's after the fact, so reviews or commentary, online exchanges. Revision can include additional findings, corrections, and clarifications. And reuse might involve summaries or repackaging for popular media versions, for instance. Nothing here is fixed. For example, in some fields, a conference presentation might be the outcome. In others, it would be used to inform the outcome. And in others, it may amplify the outcome to reach new audiences. Including greater emphasis on context makes it a deeper and more complete record of scholarly inquiry. There will be different examples for different people. And the same examples can occur in different parts of the framework depending on who's using it and for what purpose. Many of these examples represent places rather than the stuff. Some places are part of the research workflow and others may be about access. And they're certainly not all about preservation. So how do we sort out the serious stewards? What kinds of relationships do we need with those who are serious? And perhaps more importantly, what kind of relationships do we need with those who make no claim to preservation? How should we interact with them? Now we'll take a look at the stakeholder roles in this evolving ecosystem. The traditional print configuration had well-defined roles and flow. Researchers or authors create Publishers fix the outcomes intellectually, physically, and legally. Libraries and archives select, organize, preserve, and provide access to the outcomes in the collect function. And researchers, faculty, and students use the outcomes. Scholarly roles are being combined in many new ways. Now we see collecting being disintermediated. This has been happening for some time with the licensing of electronic journals and with ebooks, where um, most of the roles are fulfilled external to the library. With social media, researchers are creating and using, while the social platform could be said to be fixing and collecting. When a library publishes open access articles in its institutional repository, it's taking on the fixity role as well as collection. And in some cases, we have scientists creating a platform in which they use, create, share, and preserve, and provide access to their own data, taking on all four roles. So it's clear that the stakeholders are evolving along with the evolving scholarly record. Now I'll give you a sense of what happened at the first three workshops that took place over the past year. Amsterdam in June, DC in December, and Chicago in March. For those workshops, we had guest speakers, and then we had two-hour breakout discussions. Uh, first, I'll give you a sense of what our experts had to say, and then you get to hear what your colleagues had to say. Natasa illustrated the diversity and complexity of digital research information, comparing it to a rainbow and asking, how do we preserve a rainbow? She wanted us to think about how we can support the reuse of scientific data, tools, and resources to facilitate new discoveries. We need to take a sociological point of view because scientific discovery is a social enterprise within communities of practice. And the information takes a complex journey from the lab to the paper, evolving en route. With, terms consisting, with teams consisting of collaborating distributed scientists, notions of ownership and sharing are challenged. Natasa urged, us, urged a shift in thinking from the record to the ecology. She shared her study of the artifacts ecology of a particular nanotechnology endeavor. Their ecosystem had electronic lab boats, it included tools, it ingested sensor data, and incorporated analysis and interpretation. Scientists want help linking these artifacts. They want content extraction and format transformation services. They want to create project maps and overviews to support their work in order to convey meaning to guide third-party reuse of artifacts. 
Preservation is not just persistence, she said. It requires a connection with the contemporary ecosystem, which may include virtualizing the old environments on future platforms. She acknowledged the challenges in supporting research, but implored libraries to persevere. I forgot to mention that uh, the pre presentations will be made, made available shortly after the meeting, so, and they'll have notes and so forth. So um, just so you know, as we're going through this uh, jam-packed presentation that you'll have recourse to revisit it. Our two university librarians gave us the university perspective. They identified the concerns of the various campus stakeholders. For instance, administrators care about the identity of the institution. The Office of Research is responsible for funders' requirements. Academic departments want to showcase their faculty output to attract students and faculty. And campus IT has to manage security and feeds from the enterprise systems and trustees are concerned with governance and policy. It's all different motivations for different stakeholders on campus. They also talked about policy and compliance issues, including copyright, both at the institutional level and the individual level, privacy of records, student work, clinical data, business records, open access, whether it's an institutional or funder mandate, and um, they noted that we also have to consider rights of external system holders and, and content owners. They mentioned the myriad systems involved in research information management, starting, of course, with the institutional repository, but including course management systems, faculty research networking systems, grant and sponsored research management systems, student and faculty personnel systems, campus servers and intranets, and because the campus boundaries are pervious, disciplinary repositories, cloud, and social platforms. Daniel is from Digital Science, which is the parent company of several services such as Figshare, Altmetrics, Symplectic Elements, and Overleaf. He shared his view from the platform and stressed that the importance in transparency, and stress the importance in transparency and reproducibility of research. He said there's a need for demonstrable payoff for investors in research, and there is a delicate balance to be reached in collaboration versus competition in research. He said that we are in an era of increased collaboration, and the fourth age of research is marked by international collaboration. In that case, who owns research and the scholarly record? individual researchers, their institutions. Evaluation of research increasingly calls for demonstrating impact of research. The future will be dynamically making assertion, the future will be in dynamically making assertions of value and impact across institutions and in building confidence in those assertions. Cliff highlighted stress points. Potentially, the scholarly record is huge with an expanded range of media and channels. Selection issues are challenging. Is it sensible to consider keeping everything? There's an information density problem and prioritization must be done. Some formats seem to be overlooked, video for example. Cliff called for the hard questions to be asked. He talked about memory institutions as more than individual collections, but as a system to capture both the scholarly record and the endlessly ramifying cultural record. It's impossible to capture them completely, but hopefully we're sampling the best. It's our role to safeguard the evidentiary record upon which future scholarship depends. But the scholarly record is taking on new definitions. It includes the relationship between the data and the science acted upon it. Its contents are both refereed and unrefereed. It includes videos, blogs, websites, social media, and the traditional, and even the traditional, should be made accessible in new ways. Herbert took a web-focused view. There's a surprise. He said that not only is nearly everything digital, it's nearly all on the web, which must be taken into account when we talk about archiving. He used Rosendahl and Geertz's functions of scholarly communication to structure his talk. Registration is the, um, the claim with its related objects. Certification is peer review and other validation. 
Awareness is alerts and discovery of new claims, and archiving is preserving over time. The four functions had been integrated in print journal publishing, but now are distributed among many entities. Herbert then characterized the future environment as the web of objects. Scholarly communication is becoming more visible, continuous, informal, instant, and content-driven. As a result, research objects are more varied, compound, diverse, networked, and open. This presents several challenges to libraries. Archiving must take into account that objects are often hosted on common web platforms like GitHub or SlideShare or WordPress, which are not necessarily dedicated to scholarship. We spend most of our efforts archiving only 50% of journal articles. So this is the stuff we know how to do, we can get about 50% of, and they tend to be the easy, low-risk titles, which as Cliff had noted, are usually archived elsewhere. But web at large resources are seldom archived. Today's approach to archiving focuses on atomic objects and needs to move towards archiving complete objects with context in various states of flux as resources on the web rather than as files in systems. Files and file systems. So now I'll provide the highlights of the, um, some highlights of the breakout discussions from the three workshops. This is, gets really dense. In the category of selection, first they said collect, preserve, and provide access to your own materials. Find out what should proactively be captured from active research projects. To take into account user-driven demand, we should mine user surveys, user studies, and reviews to pull out research needs, methods, trends, and gaps. We should ensure that we have evidence for verification and that we retain results of failed experiments. We should try to identify what needs to be saved either locally, what need not be saved either locally or at all, and we should have a deselection policy. While we can involve researchers in identifying resources for preservation, in some cases we'll have to hunt them down and harvest them ourselves. We should be aware of how, we, how what we select fits into the broader scholarly record. We should establish criteria for selecting blogs and websites to archive. Maybe we use the number of hits or whether it's indexed by MLA or if it's cited in scholarly articles. We should declare collections of records so that others can depend on them. We should communicate when we've taken on a commitment to web archiving particular resources. And finally, they made recommendations to focus on at-risk materials, not the easy stuff, and to accept adequate content sampling. Under support for researchers, they said we should assist researchers in depositing their content somewhere and to ensure that the deposits are discoverable. We should offer expertise and familiarity with reliable external repositories to help researchers make good choices in use of disciplinary data repositories and provide a local option for disciplines that lack good choices. We should help researchers find and access information they need as inputs to their research, as well as helping them assure that their outputs are discoverable and accessible by others. We should use the dissertation as the first opportunity to establish a relationship, mint an ORCID, and um, mint DOIs for a researcher. We should work with grad students and untenured and newly tenured faculty as they, that may be the time they're most receptive. We should create a hub for scholars who don't know what they need to refer them to the appropriate services in the library and elsewhere. We should explore ways to link the various research materials related to the same project. We should determine for each project what is considered the object and how do we link it to its related bits. We should find ways to ensure portability of research outputs through a re throughout a researcher's career. We should build library expertise and funding into the grant proposal process, becoming an integral part of the process to ensure that materials flow to the right places instead of needing to be rescued after the fact. We should ask researchers what's important in their field and then ask them who's looking after it. 
we should offer the appropriate services to each discipline. Like social sciences might want help with SPSS or R, others want GIS, STEM and humanities have entirely different needs. So it's got to be customized to discipline. We should help faculty avoid having to profile themselves in multiple venues. We should offer bibliography and resume services. When committing to archiving, include a memorandum of understanding covering service levels and end of life provisions. And about collaborating within the university, we should try to earn our reputation through service provision and through access as opposed to reputation through ownership. And we should use service offerings to reposition the library in the campus community. We should decide where the library will focus. It can't be expert in all things. We should use policy and financial drivers like mandates or ROI expectations, reputation and assessment to motivate a variety of institutional stakeholders. We should coordinate to optimize exper expertise, minimize duplication, rebalance resources, and contain costs. We should help find efficient metrics for assessing researcher impact and enhancing institutional reputation. We should decide what kinds of statements of organizational responsibility are needed. A declaration of intent covering what we will collect, a service agreement, agreement covering what services we'll provide to whom, terms of use, and explicit assert, assertions about which parts of the university will do which things should get at least one other partner on campus on board early. Might be somebody in the Office of Research or in IT, a faculty member, a department, someone who's moving in the same direction you are. Partner up early. We should have conversations with faculty departments to get an environmental scan. We could identify what's needed, like GIS or text mining or data analysis, and then distill it either into areas the library can support or send it along to campus partners. We should know when to cede control to another area on campus. We should develop partnerships with research centers and computing services, deciding what and where in the life cycle things are to be archived and by whom. And we should, when other parts of the university decide to license data, data from vendors like Elsevier, we should offer to help with the negotiation. We should coordinate with other campus pockets of activity involved with non-traditional objects to integrate them into this infrastructure so they can circulate with the rest of the record. We should make alliances on campus so you can integrate library services into the campus infrastructure. There are limits to institutional capacity, so cooperating with other universities is also necessary. And then in uh, collaboration with external entities, we should restructure the role of the library so it functions along with other institutions and with commercial and governmental entities. We should employ persistent object identifiers and multiple researcher name identifiers to interoperate with other systems. We should help researchers negotiate on IP rights, terms of use, privacy, and other issues when engaging with environments like GitHub, SlideShare, and publisher systems. We should help harmonize open access policies and publisher agreements. We should determine which external repositories are committed to preservation. We should rely on expert external services like JSTOR, Archive, SSRN, ICPSR, which are dependable delivery and access systems with sustainable business models. We should figure out what kinds of relationships are needed with research centers and disciplinary repositories. We should learn how to interoperate with external systems like SHARE. We should pursue with publishers whether they will collect the related materials from processes and aftermaths. We should provide a gateway to infrastructure that's not campus-centric, but system-centric. We should work with scholarly societies to learn what we need to collect in a particular discipline and how to work with those researchers to get those things. We should identify the things that can be done elsewhere and those that absolutely need to be done locally. We should consider, consider centers of excellence. You could offer your expertise, for instance, with a shared video repository and rely on another institution for data deposit. We should work with companies like Symplectic to help with the impact of researcher output. 
We should identify pockets of interoperability rather, wait, rather than waiting for total interoperability to happen. We should follow the money in the ESR ecosystem to see where there are disconnects between shareholder interests and scholar values. So that's a, a mouthful of uh, what the previous uh, workshop attendees had to say. We talked about the trends and the framework and the stakeholder ecosystem. You've heard what your colleagues at previous workshops had to say. Some conclusions one might draw are that no single institution can hope to gather and manage all of or even a significant share of the scholarly record. Perpetuation of the scholarly record is likely to become a much more collective and deliberate enterprise with more tightly integrated and explicit roles and responsibilities. And decision making around the scholarly record will have to become more consciously coordinated. So now that we're all on the same page, I look forward to the next two presentations, but even more to the uh, plenary discussions. We'll, we'll take all of this a few steps closer to concrete action.